Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include EU benefits are in need of tightening The floodgates are back open EU should end biofuel misery in Africa Survey shows deep divisions on EU membership Plus, rise in power disconnections I'm Rick Timmis and this is the unit nightly news First, from our homepage, the European Union is underpinned by the so-called four freedoms, the free movement of goods, services, capital and people. There is little controversy over the first three, but the free movement of people has become a hot political issue in many countries, often whipped up by nationalist parties. Apart from racism, the two main arguments for keeping foreigners out are that they take both our jobs and our benefits. Immigration is a particularly hot issue in Britain. In the European Commission's latest Eurobarometer survey, 32% of the British people questioned thought it was one of the two most important issues facing the country. Whether you were among the roughly three quarters of people who did not support British participation in any military action against Syria, or the quarter who were open to it, you can hardly deny that the matter was adequately debated. Parliament came back early for an extended bout of agonising that was still going on last week, well after the decision had been made. Every conceivable angle was raised and scrutinised, and every point weighed in the balance bar by our MPs. But what if I told you that a proposal far more directly important to millions of families was debated in the Commons for precisely zero seconds this week and just allowed through on the nod with no media commentary until this contribution today by yours truly? Well, that is exactly what happened on Monday. Under the heading Business Without Debate, MPs from the Liberal Democrats, Labour and Conservatives often combined by hardened cynics into one despised entity known as the Lib Lab Con, took note of European Union document number 9124-13, namely a draft directive of the European Parliament and of the Council on measures facilitating the excise of rights conferred on workers in the context of freedom of movement. So this draft directive is designed to prevent discrimination against EU nationals when seeking work in another member state and is therefore the final nail in the coffin of any idea of British jobs for British workers. Copyright on that last remark goes to Gordon Brown. Land grabbing by European companies in Africa is continuing to ensure local communities suffer at the hands of large biofuel producers, according to a local activist. Abbas Kamara, programmes coordinator of the Sierra Leone network of the Right to Food, said that the European Union should step in to ensure that the human rights of people displaced and marginalised by large ethanol producers are not ignored. Now, I hope you're keeping a tally on the multiple stories coming through our site in relation to Africa. The African continent is rich in resources and it is part of a silent but intense geopolitical battle between China, the USA and the EU as each tries to exploit the continent for its resources. It's impossible to know at this stage which one of those three behemoths will ultimately win, but it's very clear who's going to lose. Eurobarometer asked people if their country had benefited from being in the EU. There is a widening gulf between those who feel that their country has benefited from European Union membership and those who think it has had a negative impact, according to a new survey. The survey published on 6th of September by Eurobarometer is based on face-to-face -face interviews with 27,624 respondents in all member states, including the EU's newest member, Croatia. I wonder if they were surprised when they surveyed anyone in Greece or Spain. <music> Ooh. 
More than 500,000 Greeks had their electricity cut off or reconnected last year, a rise in excess of 100% compared to pre-crisis levels. According to the Regulatory Authority for Energy, RAE, a total of 513,944 applications were made for power to be cut off or reconnected in 2012. This represents a 133% rise on the pre-crisis figures of 220,321 in 2008. All is not lost, however, because tiramisu by candlelight is very romantic and I don't think it breaches any EU regulations. Today in our video library, let's talk about privatisation. In this short video, Edward Spalton, chairman of the CIB, presents a discussion and in it he explains how the EU Commission ordered the closure of some 2,500 post offices. Now let's stop and back up for a moment. There have been so many privatisations, but what does that really mean? Well, post-World War II, the USA provided funding and loans for reparation after the war. The UK government at the time was largely socialist, so it used the money to buy into public holdings, things like utilities and the post offices, etc. For the next half a century, the UK taxpayer had to repay those loans. So in essence, you, me, your father and mother and probably your grandparents all paid for those public assets. What the government has done under its privatisation programme is sell those assets to private investors, in essence transferring shared wealth of the many to the few who have money. Perhaps the best were British Gas, TSB and British Telecom. Under that scheme, the UK government took public-owned assets, issued new shares on them and then sold them to some of the very same public that already owned them. Sure, our UK politicians have been complicit in this fiscal sleight of hand, but beyond that they have also been working under the rulings of the EU Commission. Given the shocking revelation from last night about the clandestine money transfer scheme, which saw EU banks loaded with $15 trillion of debt, do you feel comfortable having such an organisation stomping all over your balance sheet and liquidating your assets? Because I'm sure I don't. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>